and welcome viewers. You're watching Perspective with your host, Kriti Mishra. Change is imperative. And in the last few years of the digital wave, new technologies and scientific breakthroughs have opened on many fronts. Disruptive innovation is a process by which new technologies or business models disrupt established industries, creating new markets and consumers. Disruptive innovation is not just about creating something new. It's about disrupting the status quo and creating new opportunities. Disruptive innovation can be seen in various industries, from transportation to finance to healthcare. The advent of Industry 4.0 and 8 mega trends, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, blockchain, augmented reality, virtual reality, 3D printing, drones and robotics have demonstrated the ability to bring about large-scale socio-economic change. So how is India seizing the wave of disruptive technology? Let's analyze in this edition of Perspective. Joining us on the show through virtual platform, Mr. Abhishek Singh, MD and CEO, Digital India Corporation. Also joining us, Mr. Vinod Sharma, Chairman, CII, National Electronics Committee. I welcome both of you to Sunset TV and thank you so much for joining us. And Mr. Singh, let me begin the program with you. India has set an ambitious target of growing into one trillion dollar digital economy by 2026. How do you see the role of disruptive technologies in achieving this feat? See, like as you rightly said, the disruptive innovation and disruptive technologies are when when we when a small company or some new product or some new innovation comes in the market and it disrupts the established norms, it displaces existing industries, it comes up with new products and 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 the whole revolution takes place. We have been like this term disruptive innovation was, as you know, was first coined by a professor from Harvard, Professor Clayton Christensen. And in his paper in 1997 in Harvard Business Review, he explained how this works. He like how new technology comes in and how everything else that we used to do it gets disrupted. For example, when the when the smartphones came in, like uh, and the smartphone combined several functionalities of a notepad, a music device, a, a watch, uh, or using it for making calls. So several things. So you stop using, feeling the need of having a, a wristwatch or having a camera separate or having an iPod separate. So these, so this disrupted the existing norm. Similarly, when the digital photography came in, this whole entire industry of uh, Kodak and Konica those who used to make those roles, uh, the photo roles as we used to know earlier, they got disrupted. So innovation is always uh, creates new products, creates new value in the economy, creates new jobs and changes the way we have been looking at uh, technology, uh, looking at product uh, and looking at developing solutions. So like, and uh, we have always felt that the companies who do disruptive innovation, whether it's Apple or Google, they are the ones who create the maximum value for themselves, for the shareholders, for the countries in which they are incubated. So if India has to like uh, reach to the goal of trillion dollar digital economy, this would require dis uh, disruptive innovation because we are somewhere around 300 to 400 billion dollars right now. And if we have to reach a trillion dollar goal, it will require creating a lot of value. So what India has been focusing on is that uh, primarily India's IT digital revenue has, comes from IT and uh, IT enabled services. But if you have to go up that chain, we'll have to invest in electronics manufacturing, which we are rightfully doing by ensuring that uh, not only mobile, but laptop and wearables and all digital electronics products get manufactured in India. Second thing that we are uh, focusing on is the how do we ensure that the semiconductor uh, manufacturing starts happening in India with the fab labs, the program the government has for the 76,000 crore program, which was announced. The PLI for various, uh, the entire supply chain for electronics, how do we establish the entire supply chain within India? And how do we ensure that we get the get a big chunk of electronics manufacturing space in India? The second area from which this trillion dollar digital economy will come in, will come in from the new age technologies like artificial intelligence, blockchain, IoT, and AR, VR. So in AI, the way the world is moving, the most of the innovation, most of the algorithm-based products that are coming is coming from the US or maybe China, but India also has a huge talent capital when it comes to AI and the startup ecosystem that we have. So we are planning to invest in compute infrastructure as also leveraging the data ecosystem that we have to build AI-related projects in uh, products in the healthcare space and uh, agriculture space. And once these products uh, bordering on disruptive innovation, disruptive technologies are built by Indian companies, we will be able to reach the goal of trillion dollar digital economy. Well, absolutely, sir. You made a very interesting point there. And before I talk about specific sectors, you talked about mobile manufacturing. Now, in last nine years, it has jumped 20 times. In fact, 99% of mobiles used in India are made in India now. 
Certainly an incredible achievement for India, sir. Uh, a very strong achievement and it has been driven by not only government policies, but the investments which Indian companies have been making and also the trust that global companies have had in, uh, in, in moving their supply chains, uh, the manufacturing units to India. So whether it's Apple or whether it's Samsung or whether it's the uh, Google, they all are looking at establishing their manufacturing base in India. In fact, last week, uh, 27 uh, projects on the PLI scheme were also approved. And even the, in the laptop and notebook manufacturing space, we are looking at companies like HP, Dell, Lenovo, all of them are looking at shifting their manufacturing to India to meet the global requirements. And that is also required because the geopolitical uh, uh, situation in which we live in, wherein the, re the world knows that relying only on one manufacturing base in a country like China would not be able to su be sustainable in the long run. So the entire world is looking at India as uh, uh, for setting up their manufacturing base when it comes to mobile phones, laptops, and other electronics products. Absolutely, sir. India has emerged as a global hub for manufacturing electronic products. But moving on and talking about specific sectors, another incredible arena, of course, has been of the digital payments in India. Mr. Sharma, there is a massive disruption which is being witnessed in the payment space thanks to the UPI. From the vegetable vendor to the coffee shop to the upmarket restaurant in a five-star hotel, the QR code is everywhere. The value of transactions processed in 2021-22 via UPI was a whopping 84.15 lakh crore, five times the amount of debit and credit cards combined. How has UPI disrupted the payment space in our country? So kindly unmute yourself, Mr. Sharma. Thank you, Tia. Uh, I said, if you would allow me, I'd like to begin by making two comments on uh, what I heard uh, already being spoken, uh, uh, because it happens to come from my sector, which is electronics manufacturing. So number one, we talked about disruptive innovation. Uh, I prefer to use a more positive term called transformative innovation. And the reason for that is that the moment we say disruptive, one, it's violent, right? Uh, and secondly, we assume that something needs to be disrupted, not necessarily in many cases. We have found that actually many disruptive innovations have then, for example, if you take an Uber, uh, who did we disrupt? So we disrupted, of course, we transformed the way we move and we, uh, you know, we, we travel, but we also disrupted the existing taxi unions, the way those people were having a livelihood. And I think a certain thought is required that we don't need to innovate only with the desire to disrupt something. The idea is that there is a problem we need to solve it. Today, climate change is a big problem. You know, the air quality in Delhi is a terrible problem. So if we start looking at how can we transform this in a positive way, that most stakeholders, if not all stakeholders, are benefited, that would be a far more positive spin. And I think it's required because, unfortunately, this whole business of disrupt uh, has got too disruptive, uh, at least in my personal opinion. Now, coming to our comment regarding the mobile manufacturing, I'd like a correction again. Uh, to make a correction, which is that what we have actually achieved is the assembly of mobile phones and the and now hopefully the assembly of hardware, which by itself is no mean task. So I congratulate uh, our whole industry, my, my friends in the industry and the government on having achieved something we were not doing earlier. We were a large importer. We have now become a self-sufficient assembler and also some companies like Apple and Samsung and a few others uh, have begun to make significant exports out of the country. Uh, all this augurs very well for, for our future. As a large country, that has to be invested in manufacturing, whether we like it or not, as one of the pillars of our economy. Having said that, it is not, uh, it is not uh, absolutely commonsensical, or, uh, or I would say it's not, uh, it's not simplistic to assume that this assembly will lead to manufacturing. So the shift in global value chains that we desire, this is a shift in large investments. It is a shift in... Uh, technologies, in skills, in, in technical know-how, which needs the movement of not only machinery, but also the movement of people uh, across borders. In the current geopolitical climate, and I'm not going to go into that debate, uh, but unfortunately, this movement of people, investments, and machinery across borders is fairly disrupted at the moment for good and bad reasons. Now, what this means is this global value chains will not shift automatically. The PLI has a sunset clause. Uh, you know, and is the one that triggered this. So unless we either expand this trigger, we postpone this trigger, or we prepone somehow the shifting of global value chains, the first benefit, this work in process that we've got to assembly, will unfortunately not automatically result 
in a shift to manufacturing. And we need to be cautious about that. So I'm optimistic, but cautiously optimistic about what we are seeing. And But at the same time, this government had uh, the wisdom and the courage to take the right, make the right moves. And so far, it has, it has ticked all the boxes. So I just do hope that we continue on that path and now make all the right moves that are required to shift these global value chains. These are much larger investments, much uh, much more trust is required in shifting the, the technology and the skills from one place to the other and is not going to be as simple as assembly. And I think we'll have to be far more patient than we've been so far. We've seen that hopefully with semiconductors coming in, some announcements coming there, there is a lot of positive uh, news, uh, but we need to make sure that we need to do that. Countries that have done well in that area have done that for two, three decades in a row. Uh, so it's too early to pop the champagne, uh, but some great moves have been made. Uh, you rightly pointed out this disruption or transformative innovation is not only in the areas of manufacturing. It is in every area. I think what the government has done, for example, in digitization, uh, you know, not just UPI and, uh, you know, the transfer of money, but also the other, the identification itself and the fantastic, uh, you know, sort of the platform that is laid out, what we call, loosely call the India stack. I think that's something that could, if there is an area where we can call ourselves a Vishwamitra, where we are friends of the world and we can give them something for free, which can be transformative for their societies, especially for countries uh, that are not rich. I think this would be one of the, the digital India stack would be one of the fantastic gifts for the world that we have uh, developed in this country and innovated and got so far. Uh, obviously, as you rightly pointed out, this has brought in a lot of financial inclusion. On the background, it has also brought in a lot of data and information. Today, if you want to know which companies, which sectors, what is the value addition that's happening, how much is being imported, all that is available on the GST backbone, for example. Uh, similarly, what transactions are happening in the uh, cash economy, uh, in, the, in the formal economy, the informal economy, is all available today, fortunately, because of what we've done in the, on the foreground. And I think it's now time for us to sort of link these two together, this whole information, data, knowledge, and then make policies that help us even further. Well, absolutely. And of course, as you said, that the momentum has to be maintained. Mr. Singh? Yes, I fully agree. With I fully do agree to what uh, Vinod, Mr. Vinod Sharma has been saying, is that uh, while uh, while it is, um, we feel proud to ensure that even mobile manufacturing assembly is happening in India, but I would say that this is like the first steps and almost every country which has moved up on the manufacturing ladder has to take the first steps in order to go ahead and uh, do that and it has reduced our dependency on imports to a great extent and as we move forward this will only strengthen and this will create an ecosystem in which there will be companies who will be willing to invest in building capability for for setting up plants in which manufacturing can take place as we know electronics manufacturing semiconductors require, are very capital intensive uh, areas and very the risk capital that many indian companies have is very limited even companies with large cash surpluses they would look at other uh, channels of uh, industry uh, other channels of investment rather than looking into mobile manufacturing but once people see the value that is coming in and the growth potential that is there that would also happen in the days to come absolutely sir and you also talked about startups now startups have the freedom to embrace new and understand technologies without the constraints that established companies face. How is the Indian startup ecosystem disrupting for innovation, sir? See, like, uh, I agree with you, say the startups have freedom, but at the same time, while we romanticize the startup uh, story and the startup uh, value that they are creating, but I would also say that it's not as easy as it sounds. For every successful unicorn, there are many others who, who struggle and who struggle for various uh, various things, including getting the investment at the right time. When a company does well, they uh, when a company is like uh, broken and become a unicorn, there are many people who would want and come to buy, invest into their IPOs or want to put in money into them. But when the companies are at the ideation stage, at the product stage, at the go-to market stage, that is where they require the maximum amount of support. And somehow our domestic VC ecosystem has a lot of potential, it needs to grow much more in that direction. So while we feel proud that we have 100 plus unicorns and we have 100,000 startups that are being formed, but given the um, the lull in the investment that has happened globally in the last few years, we will need to energize the Indian ecosystem, Indian VC ecosystem to ensure that people are actually posing trust in our performing startups and ensuring that they are able to 
achieve their potential. So it's all right to, to feel happy about it, but we need to also take strong steps in order to ensure that the startups who are doing well or who have the potential to do well are nurtured and given all possible support that they may be needing. Absolutely, sir. That's a very valid point that you're making. But talking about another important sector, of course, the healthcare. Mr. Sharma, the Indian healthcare sector has been drastically transformed because of a variety of cutting-edge technologies such as telemedicine, electronic medical records. What are the challenges in adoption of disruptive technologies in healthcare in India? And how will these technologies change the future of Indian healthcare? Yeah, so, uh, when you look at challenges, I, I probably want to answer the question in a little broader uh, sense, if you allow me. Uh, not only for healthcare, but what are the challenges to disrupt to, to innovation itself? And there are a few. Uh, one, I think, uh, which was just pointed out very rightly, uh, was this, you know, which which got solved in the startup. Failure itself was, was always admonished, uh, was punished in our society in a big way. If somebody went bankrupt, for example, uh, you know, then he was a bankrupt businessman forever. And uh, he would have probably no second chance. Uh, fortunately, the whole startup culture and the way it got funded, uh, that and that's exactly how many innovative companies, we talk of Googles and Microsofts of the world or Apples, they were all formed, or, or today Elon Musk's Tesla, for example, let's not forget, was a loss-making company for a long time. So as a society, as a financial system, as a fiscal system, we need to be able to take some failures with many successes in our stride. And that's what changed in the startup thing. Unfortunately, in that case, uh, you know, the whole, uh, in, the, you know, businesses live on value. They are rewarded for value. We started rewarding too many of them for valuation rather than value. And I'm glad in a way that that, that had to come right and it has come right at the perfect time. If you look at India as an innovative country, I sort of have a feeling that actually we are, we are far away from our potential uh, in the kind of talent we have. So we've become... Uh, you know, in the software world, we started writing codes for other people because that was required at that point of time. We became a back office of the world. Uh, even in the factories business, we prefer to be a trader and to some extent now an assembler and then hopefully a manufacturer. But I think the time has now come because of our own maturity as, as uh, somebody who's been independent for 75 years, the Amrit Kal that we talk about, but also because of the geopolitical climate around us, that we should now be stand up and be counted as an innovative country. Now, what stops us from doing that are a couple of things. One is the buying culture, whether it's in the government or the private sector, is unfortunately this very L1 culture. So we, as a society, want to buy always the cheapest that's possible. In my own uh, company, when we call uh, the research and development division, jokingly, it's sometimes referred to as the reduction and deduction department. Mm -hmm. Because every customer wants a component that's cheaper than what it was yesterday. Uh, and hopefully still perform to certain standards. So I think as a society, but, but we are Mr. not Sharma, enough. But Mr. Sharma, isn't that the arena where we enjoy the competitive edge, our cost effectiveness? Absolutely. Yeah. But what is beginning to happen, you take take an example of a small light bulb. You know, today, a LED, which, you know, we all sort of celebrated so much. So from light bulbs, we went to a compact fluorescent lamp, which came to an LED. And while the world was having an LED at 300 rupees a lamp, uh, average price, India was selling it at 60 rupees, thanks to government buying and a lot of innovation that took place. Unfortunately, that 60 rupee LED today sometimes lasts lesser period than the 10 rupee lamp because as a society, we seem to not be rewarding. So LED bulb could also cost 100. But I keep telling my friends in the lighting industry, we deal with them a lot. Even the large brands today have taken warranties away. You see LED lamp as a warranty, maybe of six months or not even that. Now, what that means is that from an environmental perspective, so the point I'm trying to bring is you know, there is a gold rat, our guru once very rightly said, tell me how you will measure me and I will tell you how I behave. So if we are measured only by economic success, we will behave in a certain way. Today, if we are going to be looking at environmental aspects together with the success and bottom lines of our companies, then we would paint a slightly different picture. So when I'm saying innovative, it's not only innovative in terms of a new product or a new design or a new business model. It could be a greener product. It could be something that's more sustainable this whole business of circular economy. So it's a very, very wide topic. And, you know, these challenges, so one of the challenges I mentioned was this. Second, you will see, uh, historically, we have actually innovated in areas where we were pushed to the wall, whether it was space yeah. technology, we were denied that technology, or, uh, you know, nuclear energy at that point of time. Or today, if you see even uh, the fact that our resources are limited and the government has used this digitized method to be able to even pass on subsidies to the poorest. So wherever we are pushed to the wall, we do well. And hence, I'm very optimistic 
that we are getting pushed to the wall in many areas, uh, environment being one of them, of course. And I'm quite hopeful that we will have some really innovative technologies very soon. Mr. Singh, do you agree with Mr. Sharma? Look, what, what Mr. Sharma is saying has a lot of merit into it. Like, yes, we do innovate when we are pushed to the wall and we do have the resilience very often that we see in our industry that when, like you, the example that he gave, like the nuclear or the space research. But at the same time, I would also say that like the culture in India is changing. Like yes. there was a time when uh, engineering graduates from the top colleges like the IITs, and the IMs would only be looking at uh, going to the US or doing research there or joining the big tech multinational corporations and working from them. From that time when we graduated to when I now visit to some of these colleges, I see bright young minds thinking of building products, thinking of building solutions, working in the field of AI, working in, in fact, last week I was at an event called XROS in which I was looking at solutions made by, by young students in extended reality by using open source solutions. And there were 100, uh, 100 such solutions that were being rewarded. Each one was fabulous. And I was amazed to see the kind of energy in the student that I was seeing. Then today also, I was, we were doing a AI game changers evaluation for the global partnership on artificial intelligence that we are hosting in uh, December. And there also the kind of AI solutions that people are building for healthcare, for diagnosing tuberculosis, or for helping farmers, or for solving the NLP problem. So I see a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of a lot of uh, activity in this field. So while it is true that uh, when we don't have any choice, we are resilient and we build solutions that can ensure that we move, move up the chain. But at the same time, I also see a huge momentum wherein there are a lot of startups and a lot of uh, entrepreneurs and a lot of students in engineering colleges who are dreaming to be product innovators, who are dreaming to build solutions and not only looking at working for a big tech or going to the US or doing that. So Absolutely. that shift which has happened with the, is a very strong uh, strength that we have given the demographic advantage that we have, given the supportive digital policy space that we have. Vinod Sharma mentioned about the effort that the government has made in digitizing, whether it's the identity ecosystem or the payments ecosystem or the DigiLocker or having the open API policy in which we allow APIs to be shared uh, or even the health space you were mentioning, the Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission, the sad box that has been prepared there, and the number of companies who are working in the health space, that there itself, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll have around 20 unicorns who will be providing these services to hospitals, to doctors, providing electronic health records, providing health wallet services. So there's a huge potential that is happening. So I agree to Mr. Sharma to a great extent. At the same time, I see a lot of potential in the next five to 10 years, wherein India will emerge as the go-to place for cutting edge research, whether it's in semiconductors, whether it's in artificial intelligence, or using technology for solving societal problems at population scale. Absolutely, sir. But on that very positive note, sir, given that various governments across the globe have only recently established these types of disruptive technologies like AI, and in some other cases, they're still formulating them. So international cooperation is still a work in progress. So how do we set standards at the multilateral level? See, we are very much part, we are very much on the table when it comes to framing the guidelines with regard to regulating the big tech or, or especially in the field of artificial intelligence. In fact, last month, uh, India was represented at the UK AI Safety Summit. Uh, our minister was there, I was also there, and we kind of were part of the Bletchley Declaration, which came up with how the world, the 28 countries who are the signatories to the Bletchley Declaration, will join hands to regulate AI or to ensure that the balance between innovation and regulation is not lost sight of. Right. The, this year, we are the incoming council chair for the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence. Absolutely. And we are hosting the GPA Summit from 12th to 14th to December in Delhi. And for the whole of 2024, we will be having the presidency of GPA, Global Partnership on AI. Right, and sir. that body, we are engaging with all member countries and all stakeholders from industry, from big tech, in trying to frame regulations which do not, uh, which do not restrict innovation. It allows innovation, but at the same time, provide for guardrails which ensures user safety and we develop AI in such a way that doesn't cause any user harm and ensure that safe and trusted artificial intelligence 
is developed in a responsible and ethical absolutely, manner. Absolutely, sir. That's absolutely. So, India has emerged as a global superpower in the digital arena. On that note, thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Singh and Mr. Sharma. I'm completely out of time, but thank you so much for sharing your perspective with us. On that note, thank viewers, that's all we had for you in this edition. Thanks for watching and stay tuned to Sunset TV. Goodbye for now from my side. Oh, <laughs>